hello, hello, and welcome back once again. Uh, it's me, Big Robs McDaniel, talking again on yet another interesting, I hope, subject of philosophy and backing into politics this time. Uh, this is an extension of the last video I gave, which or made, which was on the subject of belief. And in this particular instance, I'm interested in extending that idea. Well, maybe reviewing it again, but this time doing it in a way that uh, has perhaps more philosophical content, maybe a little bit of political content as well. One of the things that, that prompted this was an incident that occurred in the news in the past week or so, which was about a teacher uh, in the UK, I can't remember precisely where, but that's irrelevant anyway, who used a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad in a piece of teaching he or she was doing at the time with a group of, uh, I think, secondary school students, looking at the whole business of diversity and religion and the business of how we respect one another and so on and so forth. And it caused a huge scandal. The, the, the cartoon concern was uh, the same one used by Charlie Hebdo in, in Paris, which again caused an international scandal, a huge uh, degree of protest from the Islamic community across the world and a great deal of political comment. And I thought it would be useful to use this particular recurrence of a similar sort of in incident as the topic material to kick off a video on the subject of belief. Oh, uh, and uh, its relevance and or irre irrelevance, I don't know. We, I'm not wanting to preempt anything you, that you as, as a viewer or students of mine really uh, want to uh, make of any of this. Uh, the outcome of the incident was that uh, the school had to endure, again, I'm using the word that the media was using at the time, had to, had to uh, endure demonstrations outside the school itself calling for the dismissal of the, of the teacher concerned, uh, which meant that the teacher ended up retreating into, into uh, 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 being put on suspension retreating into anonymity and having death threats sent to them. And uh, during the week, when I was talking to other colleagues about this subject, what became very interesting was the way in which it split people I knew and had known for some considerable while along various, various fault lines of opinion and concern with regard to this issue. There were, were those who were uh, highly defensive of the teacher's right to freedom of speech, right to freedom of expression, expression, and feeling that the response from the Muslim community locally had been something more political than religious and was concerned with the business of trying to make a, a point about uh, Islam in the light of Western Islamophobia, perhaps. And on the other hand, there were those who were highly sympathetic with the whole business of the way in which Muslims have been treated over the past two or three decades, especially since the days of 9-11 of uh, and the Iraq war uh, and so on, and the arrival of, 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 of both Al-Qaeda and Daesh, uh, and the way in which Islamophobia has grown across the world. So there was a kind of sense of a splitting around these fault lines. And what I was interested to do is to take an analysis, to look at this from somewhat more analytical point of view. Starting off with this idea of, if, since we're talking about here with clashing beliefs about a political event or a particular event, not a political event, but a very specific event, what exactly we mean by the word belief to start off with? And I think this particular issue is something that causes us a great deal of concern because for almost all of us, the idea of belief is something really emotionally charged. To believe in something is not, as far as I can see, not just the business of asserting a certain statement about the world. If I say, for instance, you know, that uh, uh, my dog's got no nose, 
it's a joke, I know. Uh, I'm not really making a statement which I'm going to be emotionally attached to. It's simply a statement which can be shown to be true or false in the way in which most of the statements that people make on a fairly day-to-day -day basis about their lives and the things they do. You know, if I go to, uh, I may wake up morning, one morning and say to myself, today I'm going to go shopping, I'm going to go to Aldi. Uh, uh, I think Aldi is, is open today. And uh, that assertion it could be rephrased as, I believe Aldi is open today. I didn't actually use that term, and I think it's important to recognize the difference between the use, this, the statement, I think something is the case, and I believe something is the case. We'll come back to that in a minute. But I think what is interesting is, if I said I believe Aldi is open, the supermarket is open today, I'm not making an assertion which is going to cause me to uh, get into a great emotional diatribe over it if I happen to be proven, proven wrong, or if somebody disagrees with me. This is not an issue which has any emotional charge attached to it. It has no, what you might call, force in terms of its social expression. It's also interesting to note there is a, there, though the two issues of I think Aldi is open today and I believe Aldi is open today seem at first glance to have very similar kinds of assertions about events. It strikes me that, that, that it doesn't. They don't because it depends how we're using those two words, to think and to believe. When I think something to be the case, what I'm asserting is, a, I would suggest, is a, 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 a linguistic phrase, a, a, a statement, which at the end of the day could be seen to be true or false. It, it's simply a matter of fact. It's not a matter which engages with any other particular issue within my social being, as you might say. So I'm simply saying something is, is, you know, that it's possibly that I could be wrong. I think Aldi is open today. I'm not saying that I'm absolutely certain of that. It's, it's a, it has within it a certain degree of doubt. And when, when you use the word I think in that context, generally the linguistic methodology we're using in order to make that statement, common, common to the language I speak, English, and the version of the language I speak, which is namely the kind of dialect that it, uh, it operates within my local area and the culture which uses it, the word think in that context very often simply means, you know, I'm not certain about this. The word belief, on the other hand, could be used in that same context, could be used in that same manner, but it's very often not used in that manner. And I think this is something I've said before, that the word belief often is, is reserved for use in very specific issues with regard to uh, areas of our, our, our world which we uh, enforce with a greater degree of import. The belief, a belief system is often something which doesn't necessarily in, include the, 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 the matter of whether Aldi is open or not. A belief system, uh, as I talk about it, is not about something as trivial as the, you know, the opening times of a supermarket. It's not as trivial as the, as the business of me saying, for instance, I think I've got diesel in the car. I might be wrong. But that's not what a belief system is about. A belief system, is, as, as we would normally, and God only knows the word normal is loaded in its own right, but as is often used, often habitually used, refers to something much more deeper, something more important to the person who's used that particular so belief systems often are a, are a series of assertions about the way in which the world is, in which has a kind of leverage with a person who's making those particular statements. By leverage, I mean to say that it has some sort of a, a importance in terms of the way that person would be seen to be leading their lives. Uh, leading their lives in terms of perhaps their moral judgments, perhaps the way in which they wish to be seen by other human beings, as maybe perhaps also has something to do with their identity. Belief in that sense of the word is a much more important issue rather than belief in the, se in the sense of something purely to do with fact or not fact. And yet the two overlap, overlap. If I say, for instance, I believe in God, that's not the same as saying, I believe I have diesel in the car. They have a different kind of weighting within life. Weighting, W-E-I-G-H-T-I-N-G, in the sense that their import is different. The, the, I would probably not predicate my life on the existence of fuel in the 
in the in the in the in the, in the car. What, unless I don't know, maybe circumstances up can we start my jumping, but I don't think it, it's all that all that likely. But it is possible to say I could predicate my life on the business of whether I believe in God or not. And people have. Martyrdom in, in the, both the Christian tradition and the Islamic tradition is, is very well known. So it, it, this particular issue about belief clearly means that certain statements, statements with regard to belief have a greater emotional and life-organizing importance to individuals than you might otherwise think. And the, even though they have a, 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 they could be said to have a truth value attached to them in some respect, I don't think that's the issue with regard to the statements that are being made. I believe in God as a statement, if I were to use it, would indicate to other people that there is a kind of moral um, life-based principle that I, I engage with as something important. By life-based, I need to say that the statement has some sort of impact on how I lead my life. Now, it's not just religion. Other areas of, 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 our, of, our, of our lives have a similar kind of uh, 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 importance to us. Whether people love us or not, and whether we love them, uh, our political feelings, our social relations of other types other than the business of, of direct love, as you might say, are all related to that use of the word belief. So I, I might, for instance, say that I believe in uh, you know, in socialism as a way to run society. I, I might believe in capitalism as the only sensible uh, uh, a way of operating in a, in a, in a coherent world, economic world. I might believe in those things. But behind those uh, assertions is not only the business of truth or, 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 or falsehood or various variations thereof, but also this whole business of why I would need to be able to say belief in the first place. I might just say that capitalism is a, is a, 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 a economic system and which has uh, a, a political value in a certain sense as the word. And then I might pass on to other things and not take it as very interesting at all. Or I might see it in turn, or I might see, see for instance, uh, that, uh, that I might say I believe my wife loves me. And that particular process obviously has a huge amount of emotional emotional predicated on it. So the word belief, it's, it's, it's contextual understanding and the way in which it's used symbolically as a tool within society has got a huge impact upon, upon, upon individuals. And I, and I think that kind of explanation, though you're probably bored with me talking about it now, is related to this, this whole process of the, 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 the story I was telling you about at the very start, about the teacher who used a... a, a, a a, a cartoon which then proved to be controversial. Why was it controversial? Because it interacted with people's belief. It interacted also with other sets of beliefs, which are the kind of beliefs you find in in this, things like school systems, where the idea of free engagement with topic with topic with topics are important, or in the business, the way in which the educational profession visualizes itself in terms of its own beliefs about being able to have freedom to engage on subject areas. Now, whether that's true or not, it's not the question. The idea is that there is a sense that this is one of the values that teachers often have and one which is often held to be true within schools. So there is a clash of belief systems here, more than just the business of the cartoon, a clash between two different belief systems, both of which see, them, see themselves as emotionally engaged with this process. Underneath all that is culture. Culture plays a big part in all that. What is culture? Culture is a hegemonic set of values, principles, concepts, and other underlying ideas which at the end of the day most of us don't talk about. Our cultures don't need to be talked about because we grow up in them. They are kind of dyed into our skin to the extent that we don't really know that it's there. That's why the, con uh, the idea is hegemonic. It, it, it's, it is such a, at such a low level, such as a, 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 a subliminally understood level that the idea of talking about it in the open often simply ends up us talking about things that are fairly obvious, like we all speak English, that we all live in the UK, the UK has got a history. They all sort those sorts of hegemonic, hegemonic, hegemonic values. And culture is part of that. We grow up with a culture, we become in, in, in embedded in it. It forms us and we form it. As time 
pushes forward this interaction between the individuals who form a culture and the culture itself provides this cascading event of, of turning over and churning over the culture into this, into this future. And those cultural issues, often not discussed, provide the framework within which these areas such as belief provide, well, provide such an important clash of ideas in areas where sensitivities occur. So where does the sensitivity occur from? It's not simply about, about religion. It's about a history of embedded processes within culture that have enforced, informed the way uh, Islam is, is viewed today. So um, you could say, for instance, that the reason why there is a sensitivity around the business of the, 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 uh, uh, the issue of, of a cartoon as a, as a prophet is not just because it's forbidden in Islam, but because it came out of this, this business of using that cartoon came out of an oppositional culture within the UK. In other words, the, the sense of difference between the dominant culture of white, predominantly Christian, predominantly uh, 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 cult politically powerful uh, 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 cultural issues within society, and a minority culture which comes from a different part of the world which still seems to see itself as somewhat alienated and increasingly alienated because of the issues that, that it has over, undergone in the past uh, 20, 20 odd years. The Middle East, the, the heart of, of Islam, is not united politically. It is it's spread amongst a number of different political inclinations, some of which are authoritarian, some of which are aspiring democratic, some of which are very, you know, faulted democracies, some of which are religiously based. You can you look around the Middle East and see that. However, the one thing that, that, that everybody who is, who is, who is, who is who largely everybody's got in, in, in common with, the, with, with themselves, and especially those at the bottom of society very often in, in the Middle East and abroad, is the business of, of religion. And they're uh, one of the dominant religions for the area, area. Probably the dominant religion is, of course, Islam. But there's more to Islam than just the Middle East. Middle East the Islam is the Middle East with regard to the core, uh, where, core where, where the core beliefs of Islam, where, of, 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 of Islam originated, and also the holy artifacts and the holy cities of Islam are, are located. The global society of Muslims, the, the the, the whole business of Islam as a global religion, and it is a very much a global religion across the entire planet. In the Ummah, the, 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 the brotherhood, the sisterhood, the family of Muslims across the world, is tight-knit because of the issue of how Islam sees itself in its historical context, and also the whole business of how Islam welds Muslims together who don't necessarily share the same languages, the same <laughs> eating habits, the same industrial backgrounds, the same, history, same, the same histories of their, of their originating countries. It provides that framework. So for, for Muslims living in the UK, for instance, it isn't just the case that they're British. They are also British Muslim and consequently have a loyalty to the Ummah, which goes far beyond the business of their pure loyalty to the, to the, to the issue of their, of their place of birth or their passport or the, the flag they happen to be saluting at any particular moment. <laughs> The whole business of that, of course, causes a sense of a, a almost hysterical, and I think hysterical is probably, probably a good idea, almost hysterical sense of doubt amongst the majority population in the UK. We think of Muslims as slightly disloyal because they have loyalties elsewhere. But this is not particularly unusual about people. We've always had in the UK a huge diverse range of, of influences on the way in which our, our, our nation operates. The, the issue of difference being seen as non-rootedness has come up in politics over the, over, the, over the past 50 years, I suppose, 60 years, 70 years, since World War II, when the idea of accusing a, 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 a subculture within a society as being to blame for everything that happens in that culture because it has loyalties elsewhere began to take on a political effect. Jewishness in Germany was often used as a, as a whip to beat, or as a stick to beat people with, purely on the basis that they were seen as not rooted. They weren't genuine German, and were genuine Germans, even though they lived there all their lives, or had loyalties elsewhere to international Judaism. And consequently, this sense of, of disloyalty was used by fascists, by Nazis, in order to turn people against Jews. 
that has started to happen here too. Whenever this this business of oh, you know, Muslims have got loyalties elsewhere comes to the fore, it is about this whole business of how uh, the UK has this sense of firing up the issue of of, of the same old you know, accusations of lacking in rootedness. This this cosmopolitanism that is often is often used as as a as a stick to beat people with because they don't totally feel that they should all be saluting the Queen at every five minutes and saying, oh, God bless her marriage and stuff like that. I exaggerate for effect. Belief, culture, international politics form a heady mix in the process of having those heady mixes together, in the process of, of, of having them around the UK, you end up in situations where it's very easy to trigger an incident. And that incident is triggered by people out of, sometimes out of ignorance, sometimes deliberately, and sometimes manipulatedly into existence by taking an, an incident that was an accident and turning it into something major. Now, I'm not saying which side of the fence this is happening on. I personally believe that the media has gone a great way in order to create a bigger issue with this, this particular problem than in reality it need be. And by pushing the idea that somehow Muslims have turned against society by being overly sensitive about the use of this cartoon in, the, in an educational setting has turned the issue from being something which could probably have, you know, with a little bit of careful handling, have been reduced in its, in its emotionality towards something which has become a national issue about loyalties. Now, I think the, the, that problem is about firing up this idea of blaming someone else for... for the internal lack of coherence and internal lack of, 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 of cultural identity, which I think post-capitalism and capitalist society has created in the UK. Alienation has created a sense of disorientation about what it's like to be British in the 21st century. We no longer have that kind of certainty. You know, king and country, queen and country, the business of loyalties that we used to just take for granted, which I grew up with no longer exist, and part of the reason for that is because of the issue of the underlying structures of culture which have to do with things like whether we, were, you know, we're, whether we feel, feel that we're part of a society at all because of the nature of the kind of work we do and whether this work has got any value or whether we, we've got continuity of work which shows that we have some sort of value as an individual within society itself or whether that we feel that our, whatever we're saying has any real impact upon the democratic system that we're supposed to be run. That creates the alienation, the alienation creates the separation of people out into individual units, and those individual units then feel themselves at odds with, especially at odds with, other cultures that are much more united and on common values that they see as important to them, themselves. Islam as a religion is not just an, a religion of uh, expression. An a religion of expression is one where people talk about it, but that don't actually do much about it. So, you, you know, many great, a great many people in the UK who say they're Christian actually probably have never stepped inside a church in recent times. They may have done so maybe when they were baptized a long time ago, or maybe when they were married, or maybe when their children were baptized, or maybe when they went to a funeral at some point. But they don't go to church services, don't take part in the, in the life of the local Christian community very much. They probably sing carols at Christmas time and watch Ben Hur at Easter. Yes, it's a joke. That's what I'm expressing in terms of what you might call an expressed religious faith, but not one that really exists. Because in religious faith, surely, in terms of faith, is not just the business of saying, I believe in such and such, but actually doing something about it. And I think that's where f belief turns into a faith. A faith which is something which causes a degree of physical commitment to the business of what, how that belief is enacted within society. So a person, for instance, will not just believe something, but will act as if they do. Uh, and for many Muslims, at least the ones I've come across, life and Islam are closely interlocked to the point where very far, very much Muslims, a great number of Muslims, it's across the planet, their religion forms a day-to-day -day part of the way in which they act as people whether they wear hijab, for instance, or, 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 or say prayers, or whether they have, whether they attend mosque, or you know, whether, they, whether they're fasting and so on, are important parts of the, not just the business of their 
loyalty to their deity and their expression of their faith in their deity, but also a factual part of the business of being a Muslim in a society of Muslims and being part of something where this matters in social, political, cultural, uh, historic, and also in terms of family, friends, your language, and so on. In other words, it has stronger than just expressive purposes. It has actual practical purposes. Now, taking that into account, it makes it plain to try to understand exactly why people would find the use of a cartoon offensive. Because it's not just offending what you might call a expressed belief, but also offending them at the most deepest level of their association with other, other people and their sense of value within the world, within British society itself. So this matters a great deal, and I think it indicates something or diagnoses at least something why the reaction was so strong. I think, you know, if somebody were to ask me, you know, how to deal with all this, this, this business, I think one of the most important aspects of it is to understand what I've just been talking about, about what, how belief functions, how it can, in many respects, become part of a, of a way to live one's life. And when it becomes part of the way to live one's life, and it's more than just the business of an idea one might have, it becomes far more forcibly enacted, becomes part of the business of, of something that's done. And when that is, is occurring, then it, 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 it's more likely that people will be sensitive about that whole process because they've obviously invested a great deal of themselves in how this belief system is seen to be valuable within the world. Attack it and you're attacking that sense of value. If diversity as a concept has any, has any, you know, has any practical value at all in terms of the way in which British society operates, then we need to recognize that sense of how belief systems are part of that diversity and have respect for other people's beliefs because of how it creates their sense of value as to who they are. I think that issue right, is probably forgotten when we're talking about diversity quite a lot. The same with equity. Uh, I like to use the word equity, not equality, because equity indicates something which is treating people according to their needs, not just treating people equally. <laughs> treating people equally is a way of dismissing them out of hand, as if somehow, well, I talked to you, this, I talked to you and you and you and you and you the same, so what are you complaining about? It's all, I treat you all the same. Well, that's not the case. Respect sense of value, a sense of being a person in your own right, demands equity. It demands the sense of treating that person according to their past, their culture, their language, and so on and so forth. Now, the irony, of course, that applies to me just as much as it applies to anybody else. It applies to transgender people. It applies to women. It applies to even to politicians. <laughs> it applies to politicians. It applies to teachers. It applies to everyone else. That understanding of equity, which is inseparable from diversity, I believe, creates the situation where we can start to like, come to grips with the business of what we do and how we you know, can avoid offending people and how they, in turn, can avoid offending us. I think those sorts of areas of respect uh, go a long way. You know, when I was a kid, my, my mother always used to insist that I was polite, and I like to use the word politeness with regard to the business of equality, diversity, understanding, uh, equity, uh, da, 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 belief systems, respect, politeness. Politeness means recognizing somebody else as being an individual and respecting them for it. So what more would we need than politeness? But I think enacted politeness still plays a big part in the way in which society works. And I think the reason why I bring that up is because it... Uh, it's probably easier for people of all generations to understand what politeness might be, and it's easier to do on a day-to-day -day basis. I'll leave it there. Rambling finished. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening. Uh, uh, if this made any sense, fab. If it didn't, ask me questions. And uh, if you want to see me do more, please do let me know, and please do let... If, you, it's interesting, if you've got any topics you think I should talk on, or topics you think I should shut up about, <laughs> and let me know, uh, I, you know, through, through the usual channels, through Facebook, through uh, my website, and so on. Thank you very much. Good night. Have a good week. Bye-bye for now.